So far, we've devoted webinars to energy, to waste, to urbanisation and to a blueprint for a green future. And this time round, it's food and water. How do we feed growing global populations in ways that are healthy, both nutritionally and environmentally? What's needed to prevent future water wars as demand for this most precious of resources exceeds supply? Can we find ways to increase yields, but reduce the use of chemical fertilizers? How can universities in Algeria make more of a meal of what they're doing, both in terms of research and setting a good example? What I want to do in my few minutes was, was give a kind of a bit of a global overview um, as far as I see it in terms of food and climate change, what we're facing, why it's important um, and, and uh, some of the things we can do about it. And hopefully we'll, we'll hear a lot about the solutions that are possible around this. So food, what we eat, it's, it really is at the sharp end of climate change. Um, all the, the food and the systems that provide it, they are um, a contributor to climate change through their emissions, uh, but also a big potential casualty in terms of the impacts. Um, I guess for me, uh, and I have a bias because this is, is where I do a lot of my research, but I think it's a big comrade for us in terms of how food can actually help us be more resilient to climate change um, and help us uh, cut emissions through understanding where our food comes from, how um, we can make it resilient to uh, the impacts. So to give you a, a couple of numbers, so as a cause, we think about climate change and often we'll think about burning fossil fuels, things like oil, gas and coal, but actually a quarter of all our greenhouse gas emissions, so carbon dioxide, methane and the others, uh, come from the, the food system globally. So it's a major player. If we're going to address climate change uh, and cut our emissions, then we have to address emissions from food. Um, and the drivers are kind of pushing us in the in the opposite direction. We've got a growing global population. Um, uh, we're probably going to hit something like nine and a half, maybe even 10 billion people to feed during this century. All of those need access to good food. And so we need to make sure that um, everyone has that access, but at the same time that we cut emissions. And a key other facet of that is our diets. Um, as we become more affluent, on average, uh, we consume more high carbon foods, things like meat and dairy. So we've got those kind of drivers in the background. Uh, but like I say, we already um, have a situation where food is a major source of emissions. We also produce enough food uh, for the world. We just don't get it to the right places where it's needed. And so uh, there are many uh, ways we can we can kind of improve the make make our food climate smart. It's um it's one of those terms which I'll explain a little bit, but I love is climate smart food is where we need to go. So I talked about a little bit about food being a casualty of climate change. Um, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change on food systems around the world. In Algeria, you know, uh, you're no stranger to, um, to to drought impacts actually to uh, to issues in terms of uh, rainfall uh, being lower than expected. Climate change is going to increase the frequency of events like drought events and their intensity, things like heat waves. Uh, we have a lot of floods here in Scotland, which affect our farmers and right around the world. Uh, a lot of the pests and diseases which already farmers have to fight with to get uh, their, their crops and their livestock to market, um, a lot of them are going to become more of an issue as climate changes. So definitely our food system and our food could be a casualty of uh, climate change, but already there's a lot of action going on to increase its resilience. So I want to talk more about how food um, can be our comrade in terms of addressing climate change. Um, and this climate smart way, as it's been described, um, in terms of increasing how resilient, so how ready our food production is, our, our farming, our food systems are to the impacts of climate change. Uh, so a good example of that um, would be things like more drought resilient crops, for instance, uh, better information in terms of uh, weather forecasting and severe weather events. But actually climate smart means doing that, making it more resilient, but doing it in a way which cuts emissions as well. So you've got this double win. You're providing the food you need. You're doing it in a resilient way, resilient to climate change, and you're cutting emissions. And one of my favourite examples of this, because I love both coffee and I love chocolate, is um, a, a method which is basically using trees in amongst, um, uh, for instance, the coffee bushes to give them shade. And so that kind of shade coffee 
that is increasingly grown around the world gives you that benefit of more resilience. If you've got a really hot day, you've got drying conditions which might damage your coffee uh, plant. The, the trees give them shade because they're growing above and uh, uh, spreading their leaves out. But those trees themselves give carbon sequestrations. So they're taking carbon out of the air. They can provide extra forms of uh, food production. And so it's kind of looking at food production in that systems way and making it more resilient. Um, really excites me, as you can tell. And many nations are already really taking a long, hard look at agriculture, so their food systems. Most nations now are really getting serious about how we tackle climate change, committing to net zero emissions. Agriculture is a major part of that. So how agriculture and land use can support the food we need, but in uh, a way which also supports climate action. A lot of that is focused on the farm itself, so on the land uh, and things like using uh, shade trees and, and more uh, climate ready uh, crop varieties, uh, but also looking at things like protecting areas so that we can produce food on the land, but it, we can also increase tree planting. We can protect biodiversity because that's a key part of our resilience in terms of the food system. But the bigger, biggest driver of it all isn't these kind of things that happen in the fields, the farmers doing their bits, the government's putting in policies. It's actually us. We are the ones who obviously uh, uh, need the food, all of us to eat. And actually what we choose to eat, what we demand of our food in terms of its quality, its carbon footprint, actually it's a sustainability in terms of does it give a good income for the farmers who are producing it? Uh, all of those things are key in terms of driving a climate smart future for our food. And our universities, I think, represent a, a leading forum for this, not just in providing the best science. And we do that in terms of um, what uh, what crops to plant, what good climate information and services are required, but also the education, the capacity building of our farmers. And actually as communities ourselves, the choices we make in terms of, I guess, having the climate smart cake and eating it, Quentin would definitely use that joke if he were here, uh, in terms of knowing what um, a climate smart food system looks like, but actually putting that into practice in our institutions in terms of what we provide uh, to our students, to our staff in our, in our outlets, and as an institution, how we work with government and other stakeholders um, to, to, to do this more widely. And in Scotland, we have a group of universities led by our students who are doing exactly this, advising the government, pushing them to do this across the public sector. So I'll wind up really by saying, I, I guess that this, the food system, sometimes it feels a long way away, but actually everything we do, what we choose to consume, sends ripples right through that global food system. And through it, each of us, us have a, a pretty major role, actually, in helping to move the food system, food production into a climate smart space. And in this year of COP26 and this decade as a whole, so decisive, food's going to be centre of whether we win this battle against climate change um, during this decade. Uh, and hopefully that will be part of the, the climate smart answer will be a key part of that. So um, I'll first highlight that another university, the University of Cambridge, has done a lot of work in this area in terms of how you actually sell food to people and where you actually position your food in your um, uh, canteens and in your universities. And by even just changing the order or the placement of food in your canteens and the order you place it on the menu in your canteens, um, the distance between different sorts of order uh, um, item that you have within your canteens, those sorts of little changes like that that do not cost anything to the university except for switching plates over in a canteen or switching where the sandwiches are located. Those sorts of small little things that a food service operator can do on your sites currently um, can dramatically change the amount of sales. So in one of the studies, just in terms of increasing the amount of vegetarian or plant forward foods on campus, it increased, so by doubling the amount of vegetarian meals, it increased the proportion of sales by 41 to 79%. That's a staggering amount of improved sales and people not going for the animal or the high carbon options on the menu just by increasing the amount of other options available. So there's very simple things that you can do here. And if you're interested in this sort of work, there is a brilliant report that's been brought out by the World Resources Institute um, called a playbook for 
dining and interventions that you can run in your own cafes in dining. So what I'm going to do in the less rest of this report, uh, this uh, five minutes, is highlight some of the things that we did while I was at the University of Sheffield on our campus from 2018 to 2020. And this didn't happen overnight. This was small, gradual change, working with the sustainability team, working with catering managers, working with the students. It's small, little steps along the way, and I was only one part of it. And these are steps every university has to go through. So it will be great to talk. And if you have any questions, please do get in contact with me afterwards um, if we can support you and the rest of this program can support you in having these conversations with all of the different people on your campus. So I'm first also going to highlight that the thing that had the biggest impact was changing the strategies, which are the big nasty documents. We all have these different strategies. And what happened was in 2018, the Student University Union sat down and said sustainable diet within the union, which is a building on campus where the student uh, union is housed. All of the food that's in there will become more sustainable. And that then led in 2020 to me helping also write the university sustainability strategy. And the big thing that was in both of these documents that had the biggest impact was the procurement policy. Now, I know it's not a very sexy topic to talk about, but procurement to me is one of these things that, um, as um, has been said, sends ripples out throughout the rest of the system. If you can, in your next versions of procurement, say we are going to be supporting local producers, then the money will stay in your local area. If you say we're going to be supporting local and healthy um, food producers and producers that are producing food with low environmental impacts, that means that the money that you're spending as a university is going into the economy and being rippled out across society, going through lower carbon um, value chains. And you may say, how do we know? How can we actually determine this? Well, the science has come on so much in the last decade. Most companies um, if they're a multinational through to if they're a local company, have access to software then you can ask them to use that software to calculate their carbon footprints for the foods and other products they're supplying to you. And, you know, people may say that's a lot of effort, but these are five year contracts. These are 10 year contracts in some cases. And so by shifting and putting it into your procurement policy that you'll be also looking at the lowest carbon footprint on items, that's a big thing. The other big thing was what we did on campus in terms of we actually did small incremental changes. And this was all summarized in an open access paper, which is here about a living lab that we made on campus. And so we did interviews and surveys with staff and students, and that led to us changing our menus. Um, putting this carbon impact on all the different low item, uh, low carbon items on our menus because we were able to from a procurement policy get the carbon footprints of all the different foods we sold. And we also switched to not selling beef burgers on certain days, which drastically reduced the footprint of one of our highest items. And we also, in different meetings, changed the fillings inside the sandwiches because we did waste audits and found that certain sandwiches, which were high carbon footprint, were also very unpopular. So why were we serving them? So that meant we developed new sandwich fillings with staff members, which led to lower carbon and more enjoyment on campus, which means better conferences. So there's lots of different steps you can do here, and I'll leave you with that. But thank you very much for inviting me to talk. I would love to talk further. If you have any questions, do find me on Twitter at sartorialfoodie. There's my email address and please do come and talk to us at the Centre for Food Policy or any of the other people on the, this call because I know we are very keen to support you in your ambitions to create a more sustainable food future for Algeria's campuses. You can look at the sustainability options on campus so you're nudging people towards the right options through menu redesign, through changing what the food is even called. There's lots of options and I'm happy to go into that more in the Q&A. But I'd also highlight there's also in the UK, um, this is something quite particular compared to Australia, for instance, but the halls of residence, the, the actual cooking equipment and the cooking facilities in the halls of residence, which are um, maybe less of a feature in in, um, Algeria, but um, what actually happens, how students live at home, universities can take 
um, issue with that and actually start to engage students in that. So we are now running at University of Sheffield a um, program involving a smartphone app to get students to measure their food waste at home in where they live and how they cook at home, how they cycle to and from their home or how they bike, trying for low carbon transport. But all of that is supported through an app which gives them discounts on campus. So which means they're putting money back into the campus shops uh, uh, and nudging them to then go for low, ca low carbon options when they then spend the money. So it's all connected thinking, but we can go into that more in the Q&A. Uh, as you say, and very, and very briefly, because I want to get to the Q&A and I want to get to one of the speakers as well, but it's, it's the, the idea presumably is, is to normalise this rather than doing this because it's a, a weird thing to do with an app, is it becomes just the way you go about constructing your day would be to include checking on those things using your app. Uh, totally. And it, it's it's basically a way to allow people to make shopping lists and to keep st tabs and for students to plan their meals. That's what we're selling it to them as. And if they use it, they get discounts on campus They're, and, you know, discounts off their transport if they scan in with the app. Different sorts of things. So it's normalising it on campus and normalising it to make sure that they get the sustainable options. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to say that uh, my areas, uh, my interest in uh, research is uh, around food waste management and food conservation, which I think plays a really major role in achieving food safety in, in one way or another, uh, especially with this uh, fast growing population uh, that is estimated to be around 10 billion people by the year 2050. And with that comes the challenge of how we can feed those growing numbers, uh, a growing number of people with different tastes with all sorts of chronic disease, with a growing, um, a growing demands on proteins and also one of the biggest problems in developed countries, are, which is obesity in underdeveloped countries or developing countries, uh, uh, hunger and malnutrition, of course. And I believe there is uh, two paths that we can follow to, to uh, solve this uh, challenge. Uh, we either should invest in agriculture, improving the soils, or inventing new technologies, um, or even promoting uh, all existing pro uh, technologies that are not really used, especially especially here in Algeria. Uh, talking about, like for example, uh, vertical farming, which is something that's really not not implied at all here, that can uh, save space. Uh, water consumption, uh, in, improve the yields, but also improve our food uh, production. And talking about food production in some regions, it's not really a problem of food production. We can actually provide the, the quantities that we need, but it's more of a, a distribution problem. Food is not really getting where it needs to be, whether it's a problem of conflict, uh, it's a lack of transportation or even a problem of um, the storage conditions. That, and that's where uh, my, my areas of um, research comes, like talking about food conservation, how we can conserve the qualities of food as long as we can, uh, can possibly can until it reaches where it needs to be. Uh, the second part that I believe we should follow is investing in changing the way we consume food. So we should switch to a more of a plant-based diet and reduce our meat consumption. So instead of consuming meat every single day, it can be a treat. We can consume it once or twice a week. And also we can consider uh, going for more meat substitutes, which is something that's not really that present in the Algerian um, diets, like talking about foods that are a bit plant-based but like have the texture and the taste of meat but the uh, the live animals is not really included in the uh, in the process but i think either path that we follow we should think uh, in a solution that can be sustainable and really that 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 respects the specificities of each region and that can, i think that comes uh, that it comes uh, you know, here the university really can 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 really help with this point through the first thing that i think as an algerian student i can notice is through our research labs like the research that we do it's not really 
um, uh, solution based. Like we should really focus on finding solutions for uh, the food problem that we have in our countries instead of just doing research for the sake of research. Uh, the second thing that I think universities should do is to uh, organize competitions between students to really find innovative uh, um, solutions to uh, our local problems, our local food problems, our local waste, food waste problems, especially in uh, residencies. Uh, um, we have a problem, a really big problem of food waste. The food isn't, I think that w uh, a part of the problem is that the food qualities isn't really respecting the needs of students. So we end up with so much waste that is not really managed and it's harming the health of students, but also uh, the environment. So I think we should really find solutions that not only solve the, the food problem, but also protect the country and also protect the planet as well. Yeah, fantastic. So um, I want to tell you about our social enterprise we set up in 2011 and it is actually learning by doing. Thank you so much for inviting me, British Council, and uh, going after such amazing speakers is such a such a fantastic opportunity. So, you know, kind of we had in 2011, which it was a time when it wasn't fashionable to do food sustainability. We have 38,000 students in our university and, you know, and actually, you know, kind of we needed to bring them all together. And, you know, creativity was the driving factor. Creativity and entrepreneurship are the two things that we need in 21st century. And those are the two things that actually helped us put Metmunch, you know, kind of manifesto together. We wanted to learn from everywhere and everyone. And, you know, kind of sustainable development goals. That was so important. Community, employability of our students. And let's not forget purposeful fun. If we make it fun and interesting, then everybody will want to be part of it. But, you know, that limitless thinking and imagination and actually, uh, you know, all the other speakers are talking about how, how you know, kind of they had to go strategy and they had to talk to various people. Let let me tell you, we were disruptors. We were the, the rebels. We didn't talk to anyone. We just kind of like did it because it was important. And we, we had to think really big, think global. This is a problem. We need to solve it. We had to start really small. We had no budget. Let me tell you, our first budget was 20 pounds of cabbage uh, from a fruit um, and vegetable market. And we made soup and we went out and gave out soup to everyone that was sustainable, locally produced. And everybody was asking us, why are you giving us soup? What's wrong with it? But we had to learn really fast. One of the keys to doing an entrepreneurial journey in sustainability is that you fail and you fail fast and you fail quicker, but you learn really quickly as well. We had to do this fearless educational journey. The world became our classroom. The, the, the sort of lecture theater was too small for us. We needed to break the walls. We needed to get all these young students out into the, into the society, into the community and into our city and actually beyond, beyond our city. And we, we actually managed to go to some other universities as well. In 2014, we got the national and international EAUC Green Gown Awards. And that was, you know, really, really exciting for us. I remember screaming for about 10 minutes afterwards. I'm probably uh, still am screaming. Uh, but in 2017, we got the highly commended award for for you know enterprise. So every time that the judges or you know all these independent, you know, kind of like thinkers were saying that you guys are doing an amazing job. We kind of like got fuel for growth and development. We became this washing up line of creatives. And again, people didn't know exactly what we were doing, but we were talking about food, food waste, kind of like talking to students about how to cook, where to cook. We were doing videos. We were doing social media. We actually didn't have a website. We only had a Twitter account when we started. And then someone said to me, Holly, this is shameful. We need to kind of like create a website for you. But, you know, that community spirit, that heart, you know, where you have to change things and behavioral change takes guts and it, it takes guts and hearts. 
but you cannot do it alone. No good thing in the world comes uh, from doing it alone or solo. So we needed about, let's say, 15 students to start with. We went to about 100. At the moment, we've got a thousand students that have gone through MetMunch in the last 10 years. And my God, they are the most passionate, amazing young people I have ever seen. But we went to museums, taught people what space food would look like. We actually created a mobile kitchen in the middle of campus because it wasn't enough that we were dealing with our 18 year olds. What we wanted to see what seven year olds were telling us. We created edible plates for a sustainability summit. We created lots of vegetarian and vegan food. You know, the, the, the image you've got there is 300 broccoli burgers that we fed to 300 kids in the local community. It took us three days to create broccoli burgers that actually didn't uh, come to pieces. We went to, you know, kind of uh, obviously local museums again and art galleries telling people about the antioxidants of food, where their food comes from, the vanishing of the bees. We even got elderly people involved in, um, you know, kind of like knitting fruits for us so we could actually encourage kids to eat more fruit and vegetables. We involved fashion designers so that, you know, kind of like we could bring some sartorial you know kind of like fun into what people are eating or how they want to eat you know kids started building unicorns where their cheese come from being in cheshire in manchester obviously we had our own local cheese and local vegetables but you know our our key was education and empowerment up to date you know kind of face to face we have educated around 80,000 people with our own students as our catalyst for change. Now people actually come to our university to join MetMunch and we've got blogs about this. People actually know MetMunch, you know, and, and actually now I'm thinking maybe we should have chosen a different name. Maybe, you know, kind of like we now need to grow away from MetMunch, but we are there for welcome of the students. We are there for all the big events. We are there for mental health awareness week, you know, kind of getting the students into our labs and educating them about sustainable foods. Last year, we got the opportunity to create a cafe, a sustainability cafe on campus, farm to fork, locally sourced, you know, food waste prevention, a bit like a living lab where Christian was telling us, but we were not satisfied with a little bit of tweaking of the of the menu. We actually wanted to revamp um, and and you know, and actually we found this corner of our fantastic business school, all award winning, beautiful buildings. But actually it was a bit dead, you know, kind of it was not used. It was a bit dull. It was a coffee shop. And actually we didn't have any budget once they Again, you know, kind of the best thing for creativity is having no budget because then you you really kind of like get your creativity going. And actually, this is the image of the Grow Cafe 2019. We launched it on on the Welcome Sunday of the university. Those colorful chairs where the chairs were rescued from the vice chancellor's refurbished office and it was in a skip. We had to, you know, paint them very quickly um, and we didn't think that the chairs are going to become the most successful thing about this cafe because now this cafe is known as the Rainbow Cafe, the, you know, the, the, the kind of um, diversity cafe or their unicorn cafe. We talked to the local, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, farmers, you know, all the food is artisan, the students developed everything and actually the queues started growing and growing. I got this unhealthy obsession with the queues. As you can see, the second queue is on the second day and the students actually voted with our feet uh, with, with their feet because we actually suddenly in the first month had 170 percent increase 21,000 customers 41,000 transaction this is not just the work of one person but a group of people catering and everyone coming together doing it in an entrepreneurial fashion next 10 years is going to be really interesting we've already had other students from other university contacting me kind of on LinkedIn sort of saying we've seen what you guys have done can we join you so we have now created Unimunch which is now the bigger, broader, you know, kind of met much for everyone and every university can learn from us. It's more like a cooperative. We're not going to charge. We're just going to share our information with everyone. Uh, next time round, Ian Patton from EAUC will be in the chair as we explore some of the diverse reasons to preserve biodiversity as human activities continue to 
destroy and damage unique and irreplaceable environments and push plants and animals to the brink of extinction and sometimes over that brink how can we better balance consumption and conservation that is it plug over webinar over nearly time for my dinner uh, i'm off to get some vegetables ta -ra.